Uh, there's a, a story, and it's true. And I read about it some years ago. Uh, back in California. And it's the story of a physician who is treating a woman in her mid-80s who was in fairly good condition. Actually, pretty good condition. She either walked very fast or she jogged every day. But her doctor became concerned about her, even though her health was good. And he warned her about overexerting herself. And so she heeded his advice and she ceased most of her activity. And several month, months later, he sat in the funeral parlor attending her memorial service. And later he said, I could cut out my tongue for ever having told her to be careful, to stop exerting herself. I will never give that advice again. Today, a great deal of our focus is going to be on poor counsel. The counsel that we see that is given to the Apostle Paul. It's given by well-meaning friends, but it's poor counsel. If you haven't already turned with me, please, to the book of Acts, fifth book in your New Testament, the 21st chapter, is where we now start as we continue our series in the book of Acts. Looking at the first four verses to begin with. Acts chapter 21. Verse 1. They're still on that missionary journey. Luke, who's writing this. Luke writes, when we had... Parted from them and set sail, we came by straight course to Kos, the next day to Rhodes, from there to Patara. When we found a ship bound for Phoenicia, we went on board and set sail. We came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on our left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, because the ship was un to unload its cargo there. We looked up the disciples and we stayed there for seven days, through the Spirit they told Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. In other words, with some tearful goodbyes behind them, they were on their way. And after a day on foot, they happily got on board a ship that was headed in the direction that they were headed. And this reads like a journal when Luke writes that Cyprus came into view on their left, but soon it was out of sight as they stayed on course for Syria. And I can imagine Paul and his team topside taking in all the sights. And they docked at Tyre, and they looked up the local Christians there and stayed with them for seven days. Talk about imposing. No, not really. Again, we see the incredible immediate unity that we share and should share in the body of Christ. And the person who is within the family of the church is better equipped with friends than anyone else in the world. Have you ever had the experience of traveling internationally and you run into some Christians and all of a sudden, hey, we're family? How about just here? You meet a Christian and what happens? You've got an, an immediate bond. In verse 4, we see that it says, through the Spirit, Paul was told not to go to Jerusalem. These words implied that the Christians in Tyre uh, had a word of knowledge from the Spirit of God that Paul was not to go to Jerusalem. But in chapter 20, Paul kept saying he was bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Remember that? So was this conflicting guidance by the Spirit of God? No. Not from the same Spirit. God doesn't tell one person one thing and another person another regarding the same issue. So here's what I think happened. The Spirit of God revealed the dangers ahead for Paul, and that's about all the Spirit revealed. And in chapter 20, we read that Paul had already heard from Christians many times over about the dangers that await him in Jerusalem. But these people interpreted the news of danger as Paul's not supposed to go. You know, often loved ones and friends get the same guidance as we do. 
but it can be filtered to us through the grid of their own fears or concern for our safety. And sometimes our theology gets in the way as well. We can't imagine that trials and difficulties could ever be the Lord's will for people we love. Success, you know, ease, peace without conflict, uh, those are the signs of the Spirit's leading. Not a chance. Read the book. If anything, it's the opposite. God's will may be for success and for ease and for peace, but those can never be the indicator of God's will because success is doing what the Lord asks of us, whatever it is. Did you ever think of success in that way? Success is not numbers. It's not growth. Those may come but only as the byproduct of obedience. Success, in God's eyes, is our obedience. Jesus' death on the cross sure didn't look like a success to anybody, except to the Father. Jesus was obedience. Now, ease, that comes when we live in the flow of the Spirit. You know, you do it in the Spirit's way, in the Spirit's timing, and that's where the ease is most experienced, compared to striving in the flesh. Anybody try to force something? You ever try to force God's timing? How did that work out for you? Peace is the inward gift that God gives us in the midst of outward frightening circumstances. Peace isn't necessarily external. Oh, everything's great. And there's peace all around me. No. It, it's in here, that's where you have the peace, simply in your knower that you know you're doing what you're supposed to do, even though all hell is breaking loose around you. But you're being obedient, and it's doing it in the, the timing of the Spirit of God, who moves you right where you need to be at the right time, and then you've got that inner peace that I'm doing the right thing, this is tough as can be, or I'm scared to death, but I'm going to do it. You know, we talked about this before, you know what it's like to do stuff. When it's not scary. And then when there's something you, you know you're supposed to do, but it's scary, you usually back away. Have you ever thought of just, well, do it, but do it scared? <laughs> do it scared. Because obedience is what matters. You know, it's dangerous to think that we're doing the will of God only if we're suffering and we're facing trouble. You know, circumstances can't be trusted to give us a final assurance that we are in the will of God. Verse 5, when our days there were ended, we left and proceeded on our journey. And all of them with wives and children escorted us outside of the city. There we knelt down on the beach and prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. So the church entire, they gathered for prayer. I love it. Everybody. Moms, dads, all the kids. And how good it is to see, you know, every member of the family in church. And they're all out there on the beach seeing them off to the ship, and, and they all knelt together on the beach, and they pray after another round of saying goodbye. You know what that goes like. They climb on board the ship, and they set off again. Verse 7, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for one day. And so simply saying a short sail to Ptolemais, completed their voyage on the, on the ship. Verse 8, the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So Paul and his team stop off in Caesarea to visit an old friend, Philip. Remember him? When it says he was one of the seven, that was to be an indicator to everybody who's reading this letter understood who it was. He was one of those seven deacons that were appointed to serve those widows in the early church. Remember that? 
That's Acts chapter 6. He was sent to Samaria. If you remember, he was sent there to preach. And spiritual awakening broke out. And Philip began as a deacon. He became an evangelist. And you remember one time as Philip was praying, the Spirit of God told him to get up and leave and go to a certain road. Remember that? So right in the middle of of this time in prayer, right in the middle of all that God was doing, his revival and awakening is breaking out. Philip is obedient to the voice. He trusts God with the follow-up of those people he's been working with. And Philip goes and he meets this Ethiopian man who is the queen's treasurer, the queen of Ethiopia. He worked for her. And Philip leads him to Jesus and then baptizes him. And apparently he disappears. When the Ethiopian came up out of the water after getting baptized, looked around, Philip's gone. And then it simply says, He showed up in Caesarea. Hmm. So Philip is settled now in Caesarea with his family, and he has four single daughters who have the gift of prophecy. How how many dads here? How would you like to have four girls that are prophetesses? They're prophets. Would that be good? I think so. I think it'd be exciting. And what if all four of them, they all agreed on something and you didn't? <laughs> Man, they could dog pile you. Prophetic dog pile. But I, just, I love that this is mentioned here. It should be. Um, it's pretty unusual. All your kids are prophets. But wouldn't that be a nice thing to pray for? I read this and I think, oh God, make my kids prophets. Speak to them. And speak through them. Make my kids prophets. That's a good prayer to pray. Verse 10. While we were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and took Paul's belt bound his own feet and hands with it and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. Agabus, remember him? He's the prophet who foretold the famine back in Acts chapter 11. And in the scriptures, prophets at times, they dramatized their message. And in this dramatic way, he warns of what Paul is going to face in Jerusalem. He, He takes Paul's belt that was holding his, his long tunic together, and, and, he, and he gathers this, you know, belt around his, his hands, his feet. And sounds like he probably lays on the ground. It's all tied up, and then he speaks this prophecy. This is what's going to happen to the owner of this belt, who is Paul. Now, again, this is nothing that Paul didn't already know. Verse 12, when we heard this, we and the people there urged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul, he could have handled what Agabus said. But when Philip and his daughters and Paul's companions, even Luke, notice the we in verse 12. When we heard this, we urged him not to go. They all plead with Paul not to go. The pressure was getting too much. Now, Agabus' prophecy didn't tell Paul that he wasn't to go to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? It simply made it clear of what would happen if he went. Paul not only had to receive and handle that information about what the Jews would do to him and then hand him over to the Gentiles, the Roman government. At the same time, he had to deal with his friends who wanted to keep him out of danger. You know, it is not easy to fly in the face of a bunch of friends, all of whom believe your decision and your direction is wrong. You been there? Paul stood alone in the guidance he had received. Have you ever had to stand alone in the guidance you have received from God? I don't want to do it that way. I want confirmation. I want other believers to say, hey, we're hearing the same thing. You need to do this, no matter how difficult. 
But do you have it in you to stand alone if you have to and obey what God has said? Obey your marching orders. So how do we explain the, the counter convictions of these friends? The Spirit did not give different guidance. Again, I think it's all about interpretation. Paul's friends heard that hard times were coming, and they did what so often friends do, and that is to attempt to shield their loved ones from danger. Now, there's nothing wrong with those feelings. But they had to do what so many friends and families have had to do, and that is to let go of the person God is calling and entrust God with that person's safety. And I tell you, too many people obey the voice of the concerned person and they miss out on all that God has for them. Have you been there? Has somebody ever talked you out of God's will? And you knew it was God's will. Verse 13, we see that the anxiety of his friends began to wear on him, and it was perhaps cloud in his vision, and you know, all the physical exhaustion of the days of travel, the persistent questioning of, his, of, of that guidance. You know, are you sure you heard from God correctly? And dealing with the panic of his friends, it finally burst in an explosion of emotion, verse 13, where he says, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? It's as if he said, why are you doing this to me? I need your encouragement to follow the Spirit's leading. Instead, you're crippling me with your grief over what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem. And the actual word Paul used for breaking, as in breaking his heart, is actually to crush together. And it implies that his friends were crushing his guidance from the Lord. You know, God does not speak very loud when he speaks. Your friends could be very loud. They could even drown out the voice of God. If you choose to let that happen. So here it's making him question his own heart's desire to obey the Lord. Paul went on to say that they shouldn't persist when he said... For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul didn't fear what was coming, did he? He didn't fear death, he said. He only feared not obeying what God was clearly telling him to do. I've been there, have you? That should be our fear. Our fear should be not obeying God. Only after this courageous statement where Paul's friends able to say what they should have said all along verse 14 since we could not since he would not be persuaded we remained silent except to say the Lord's will be done did they just give up trying to talk him out of it you know what's tragic is that nobody stepped forward to say Paul I'm for you You've received guidance from the Lord to go to Jerusalem. You know, I, I know it's going to mean arrest, persecution, imprisonment, and who knows what else, the unthinkable. But I praise God that he will be with you and he will use what you will go through for his ultimate purposes. You, Paul, do what you got to do. I want friends like that. Have you ever had clear guidance from the Lord about what he wants you to do in obedience to him? Have you ever been dissuaded from following the Lord's guidance because of conflicting guidance from others? Has your own or others' concern for your safety kept you from pressing ahead to follow that guidance? Do you equate being in the Lord's will with everything working out happily ever after? Has your own fear of radical obedience ever prompted you to crush somebody else's determination to do the will of God. Abraham had to learn to trust God 
and what he heard from God and obey him completely, regardless of appearances or counsel from others, even those who he dearly loved, including his wife. As Henry Blackaby notes in his book, Created to be God's Friend, one of my favorite books on my bookshelf, God had made his covenant with Abraham, and of course with Sarah included, but it seems that God left it to Abram to share extensively and adequately with Sarah all aspects of his covenant. It was the heart of Abraham that God trusted, and Sarah, though absolutely sincere, gave counsel, but not from God. It is obvious that she believed a child could and should come from her husband, but she was not sure that God could bring a child through her. She urged Abraham to consider her reasoning, and Abraham agreed. God did not intervene. Even when he knew the severe consequences of his decision, God knew that Abraham knew clearly the covenant that he had made. Abram must, on his own, on his own, keep his life clearly focused on God, especially when different counsel was given. You and I, we have got to keep our lives clearly focused on God, especially when different counsel is given. Now I will say, when somebody asks me about a decision, something that they want to do for the Lord, and maybe there's some safety issues and some questions, you know, like this, you know, should you go? It might be dangerous, etc. The only question I need to ask is, are you sure you're supposed to go? Did, how do you know the Lord told you? If they can say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is calling me to do this, then go. But if, if there's uncertainty, and after more prayer, more seeking the Lord, if there's no affirmation, yep, you're supposed to go, it's okay. I don't think you, I don't think you have to do that. There's other ways, other times to serve God and, and that thing that maybe you want to do. There's a timing again. Remember that? There's a timing. Godly counsel is never a substitute for a word from God. God may use our friends to speak to us and share his word with us. But mere counsel from godly family or friends is never a safe substitute for a word from God and obedience to him. And this danger often comes immediately to many followers who are following a call of God to mission work. Upon sharing God's call and claim on their lives to missions, I'm talking like long-term missions, they're going to go to Papua New Guinea for three years or more. Then family members, friends, oh, are you sure? You know, what are you going to do if you get wounded? What if you get hurt? There's no hospitals there. What if there's no life flight there, etc. cetera? Um, often, family members come up with a, a way out. Well, can you just do missions at home? I mean, there's lost people here. There's people that need to be saved in the United States. Just, just do it here. There are many very special believers who heeded the counsel of their parents or friends, and they didn't go on the mission field. Instead, they stayed home, and they lived with the consequences, which is sometimes quite significant. We all want to know God's will for our lives, and we need friends who will not protect us from God's will. We all want to know God's will for our lives, but we need friends who will not protect us from God's will. And we should all long to be the quality of followers who can urge others on in faithfulness to him, regardless of the cause. 
don't know the future, folks. Don't know what's coming. Got a pretty good idea. Don't know exactly when. But as things can get rough for us as Christians, specifically because we're Christians, You just never know what God's going to call you to do. Who he may send you to. But I can guarantee he can tell you. God is more than able to make it very clear what he wants you to do. So I'm talking about something outside of the the general revealed will of God, which is that we go and make disciples of everybody. But if there's a specific place and mission, a certain thing he wants you to do, a place he wants you to go, if God can make it clear to Moses through this bush that's on fire, but not being burned up, not being consumed, if God can make it clear to Noah to build this boat, a real big one, even the kind of wood to make it out of, how to make it watertight, all that stuff, I think he could probably tell you exactly what he wants you to do. And when you hear it from him, here's the thing, he will make sure you know you have heard it from him. Let me tell you how this works. If, if, if you're going, well, I'm not sure what I should do, I don't know, well, you probably haven't heard yet. When you know you have heard from God, you know what to do. It's when you make the decision, I'm supposed to do this because God has made it clear. Here's the thing. You might say, well, how does he speak? How do I know? All I can tell you is this. He will make sure you know you've heard his voice. God has no problem using whatever means he wants that he knows you're going to understand this is God beyond a shadow of a doubt calling me to do this. It's not coincidence. This is actually the God of the universe guiding me to do this thing He will make sure you know it was him telling you that. That's how you'll be able to proceed with confidence, no matter what it is that he's calling you to do. Do you understand? God is more than able to convince you that it is he who spoke to you. And then you will know if you're disobeying or not, because you got a clear word from God. And when other people may talk you out of it, you will know that Counsel is contrary to what God gave you. And then you've got to demand of yourself to obey the voice you've heard, God's voice. Something I like to do is journal, especially when I've heard from God, because I know when I've heard from God, challenges are going to come. I may be tempted to disbelieve what I heard or think, did I really hear from God correctly? Write it down because you're going to need to go back to that moment and then read what you said. What, what happened to you? Write it down as soon as you hear from God so it catches everything. The moment, the circumstance, the details, your emotion, that you just know that you know, you know when you're knower, this was God. Because you may need to go back to that. And once you go back to it, because I've done that many times, I've gone back to that moment that page in my journal, and I go, okay, I got to do this. If anybody here has sensed a call from God and you've been reluctant to obey or you feel that you've missed out on what God had for you, you need some support right now. And we should pray for you. And if that's you, and it may not be anybody in this room this morning, but if that is you, and you are being especially tugged at right now, would you stand? Keep standing. More coming up. Keep standing. Keep standing. Oh, boy. Thank you, Lord. Here we go. Here we go. 
Listen, keep standing when you're, I'm going to keep talking to you, okay? Don't even buy the lie that you are the only one who struggles obeying God. When he has given you something, he's called you to do something. He's calling his people to do stuff. I'm surprised not everybody's standing. He calls all of us to do something. His spirit who was in Paul is in us, calling us to do stuff. Now, maybe we're all a bunch of primarily obedient people. You're better than me. But I tell you, when you know that you have been spoken to and you, you took a pass on it, the question you have now, I'm sure, is, is it too late? Is it too late to obey? God, are you still speaking to me? God, is that opportunity still open? Are you still asking me to do this? I'm telling you, I had heard something some years ago. And oh boy, I remember years went by. And I hadn't obeyed. And I asked, oh God, is it too late? And I believe he gave me an opening to do it again. Sometimes it could be too late. He, he had to plug that hole with somebody else who was willing to obey right away. And because you're standing, I'm not going to interpret that as, oh, you were disobedient or something. You know, this, you know the details of your situation. And maybe you're just asking for more clarity. Maybe you're just saying, God, I had so much pressure back then. I'm, again, I'm so amazed Paul even kept going. Most of us, we would have drowned under that pressure. Unless you're better than, than the Apostle Paul there. So for those who are standing, and if uh, you just can't stand right now, but you're in that same spot, let's pray. Let's pray this, ready? Father God, we're asking right now that it is not too late. And that these who are standing are going to be like Jonah. For whatever reason, they took a detour. Or they were detoured. But you still called them back. Lord, if you need to send a whale. Like you did to Jonah. To deliver these people to the place you need them delivered to, then Father, bring the whale. Lord, you are speaking to your daughters and your sons today to seek your will at this time. You're speaking to all of us to seek your will. And oh, we need to know your voice more than ever before right now. And we're asking that by your grace and your mercy, you would grant them Grant all of us another chance. And would you speak to them about what it is and what their next step is? Perhaps they already know what it is. They just haven't taken it yet. Lord, I'm excited. I'm encouraged. These folks are about ready to experience you in a new way. Bless them. Call them, fill them, equip them. Use them to accomplish your will. That their lives would be changed forever. And those who you touch through them, their lives will be changed forever. And this is what we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.